It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to another special episode of Science on Top. Today is Sunday the 8th of March 2020. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by Penny Dumsday. Hello. And Lucas Randall. Hello. And joining us is an epidemiologist working in chronic disease who's written for numerous media outlets and is a podcaster covering sensationalist scientific misrepresentation. Welcome to the show, Gideon mayowitz Cats. Hello. It's great to have you on here because I feel we really need to take an in-depth look at the recent coronavirus outbreak. There's an extraordinary amount of misinformation floating around and it's an ever-changing event where we're constantly learning new things and old advice is being changed and updated. So I really want to sit down and get the record straight here. So thanks for coming on. That's my pleasure. Let's begin with just the basics. So what is COVID-19? What is coronavirus? What are they and why are they called that? So a coronavirus, it's a species of virus that I think are named because of the structure. They've got uh, little crowns on the surface of the virus. COVID-19 is the respiratory disease caused by this new virus, which is actually called SARS, S-A-R-S-C-O-V-2. So COVID-19, which is what most people are using, is the disease that's caused by the new virus. And the new virus was officially named, I think, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, mid-Feb, by the World Health Organization as SARS-CoV-2. And that's just basically severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2. Because the last SARS epidemic that most people remember in the early noughties was also caused by a coronavirus and also caused severe acute respiratory syndrome. So changing the name is slightly different to delineate the two viruses, I think. Yeah, I was going to ask if it was linked to that. Yeah, so they're, they're both, both diseases are caused by similar viruses from the same mm-hmm. family of viruses. Hmm. Is this an airborne thing like flu? Is it from, you know, contaminated food or something? How do we catch COVID-19? Well, I think there's a bit of misunderstanding generally about what airborne really means. Mm -hmm. By every indication that I've seen, the primary method of transmission for COVID-19 and and for the virus is a droplet. So it's a droplet-borne disease, which is similar to a lot of viruses. And what that basically means is that respiratory fluids, so, you know, spit, coughing, and sneezing, it's not as well, um, get into the air or on your hands, and then uh, they're passed from person to person, primarily through fomites, which is basically any surface that a virus stays on and lives on for any period of time. So, like, you sneeze into your hand, and then you use your fingers to push a button on a on a lift, and then someone else pushes the button, doesn't wash their hands, touches their face, then they get infected. Uh, you can also pass it by sneezing directly onto someone's face, but generally that's, that's slightly less common. Certainly very rude. <laughs> it's very rude. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, no, I, I, was, I was trying to be a bit funny there. Uh, <laughs> it does happen. People sneeze and they don't cover their faces and then sure. it gets onto you. But unless someone's coughing directly into your face on the train, it's probably more likely that it's to do with uh, the sp- you touching something that someone else has touched with their dirty, right. dirty hands. That's probably more uh, probably more of a tram syndrome as well. I imagine tram people tend to cough. Yeah, that's just that's I can't back Sorry, that up at all. Sorry, tram. Uh, <laughs> what is tram this? Tram oh, no, people cough in your face. The dreaded tram people from the planet Tram. <laughs> Well, it, it's uh, as the, there's a great comedian, James Colley, uh, tweeted, if someone, because of the coronavirus spread, if someone coughs in your mouth on the train, don't kiss them, thank you, in response. Always, oh, always a very good... in uh, your mouth. Oh. <laughs> but no, I think that's actually a really important point, is that this isn't spread just by being in the same room as someone. It's not like the flu, which, you know, is an airborne and just will float around from your breath. Is that right? It, it has to be those sort of heavy droplets that get sneezed onto you. Yes. 
so I've seen some different opinions here. Um, I think the flu is also primarily spread through dro- uh, droplets, so sneezing and coughing oh, okay. and then wiping it on various places. Um, tuberculosis is something that stays in the air, from my understanding, so you can potentially pass that just by being in the same room with someone who has tuberculosis. Uh, but my understanding, and th- so I should preface anything I'm saying at the moment with the statement that no one really knows yet. No one is certain of anything. Um, but from what I've read, most of the indications appear to be that it's uh, not uh, airborne. There, there are no aerosolized droplets that stay in the air for long periods of time. It's mostly about the surfaces that you touch and the surfaces that other people touch. Right. Fair enough. Yes. And how infectious is it then? Because I've seen lots of different rates floating around that, you know, there's a 3% infection rate or 2% or something. So where are we at with infection rates? So you've got the basic reproduction rate is the easiest place to start. And what that is, is the number of people that a person who has the disease will infect in a totally susceptible population. It's the basic reproduction rate. And it's usually represented with the statistic R0. Mm-hmm. And this, that, so totally susceptible would, uh, I assume, exclude things like government interactions and, you know, programs to, you know, get people to stay home and work from home and all this stuff. As though just everyone was going about their normal, normal day, yeah? Yes, precisely. So completely no one doing anything at all to stop the spread of the virus or the infection. Mm-hmm. Um, so for influenza, seasonal influenza, the reproduction rate tends to be between 1.1 and 1.5, which is, I think, a good place to start. And I, know I've, I have seen a lot of people saying that comparisons with influenza are problematic, and I agree. But I think for the purposes of understanding just what they are, uh, influenza is about 1.1 to 1.5. Measles is between 12 and 18, so it's extremely infectious measles. Most estimates of the coronavirus are not are between two and three so for every infected person two to three people will be infected that seems a lot though that's kind of worrying actually like that's a household uh it's quite a few yeah i mean that's basically what's what is the the worry with this virus is that it is relatively infectious um but it's also not as deadly as some previous outbreaks of similar disease. So SARS um, caused people to become very sick very quickly and had a very high death rate, whereas this disease causes people to become a bit less sick and a bit less quickly um, so it can be spread further. That's the indication at the moment. Okay, so two to three people are likely to be infected from any one infectious person, provided there's no methods used to reduce that risk but you say it's not as deadly as say SARS-1 so what is the how deadly is it so the the first thing to say is that by all indications this disease is significantly less fatal than either SARS or, or MERS MERS was the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome and those two diseases one of the the reasons why they were much easier to control with quarantine was that people got very, very sick, and most people, I think, who caught MERS died. So it had a very high fatality rate. Mm. So for every person who's infected, how many of them die, essentially? Is that what we're looking at? So, yeah, the the basic calculation for a case fatality ratio is take the number of cases, the number of deaths, divide the deaths by the total cases, and that gives you a percentage of people who have died as uh, as a proportion of the number of cases. But the, the biggest point about the ratio is that it will change. Absolutely will change, and a lot. It'll change very quickly. So, for example, in China the case fatality ratio at the start of the epidemic was about 3%, and then it went down Mm -hmm. to 1.5%, and then it's increased again to about 3%. And the World Health Organization's initial estimate of the case fatality ratio was 1.5%, and this was uh, at the beginning of February, and now they've said that the current ratio is 3.4% worldwide, But if you look at the recent paper published in The Lancet, 
and several other papers that have also been published uh, in the Journal of the American Medical Association and um, also a few on, on MedArchive. The estimate of the true case fatality ratio is likely to be a lot lower, okay. uh, somewhere between 0.5 and 1%. Because I was thinking 3% sounds really high, like... Yeah, no, 3% is extremely high. Measles is a dangerous, nasty disease that we that uh, a lot of people used to die from, and that has a case fatality ratio of about 0.2%. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah, about yeah. Two, in, 2 in a 1,000 people. Uh, but we think it's going to be lower than the 3% that is now. It's going to be about 1.5, Is did you say? Um. So, depends. There are a lot of estimates and it's hard to know for sure, but uh, the true ratio, ratio or rate is likely to be between 0.5 and 1%, oh, it okay. seems. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's comforting. Yeah, that, that, <laughs> well, I mean, to an extent, that's still very high. Yeah. Um, but it is, I, th- I think it's uh, one of the things that, so there was a paper that's been released by a group in China um, based on some of the epidemiological data from Wuhan. Um, and their estimate is that roughly or that between 59 and 80 percent of all cases are either asymptomatic or so mild that they are not tested. So we only identify between um, 20 and 40 percent of the cases, essentially. So that that's probably a good thing for the stat, isn't it? Because that would drive it down. Rather than being 3%, it might end up being something more like the flu around 1.5 or whatever, because we might actually only know about you know, less than half of the cases, in to- you know, the, the real cases, because we haven't, they haven't presented to hospital or their doctor or whatever. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's exactly right. It's entirely possible and quite likely, uh, based on all of the evidence so far, that significantly fewer people, um, that the, the case fatality ratio is being pushed up because a lot of people are asymptomatic or only very mildly symptomatic, so they're not tested and they're not part of the confirmed cases that are used to calculate that statistic. Gotcha. But that's also, I think, part of the danger, isn't it? That there are people who are completely asymptomatic or, as you say, only have very s- slight symptoms, but they can still spread the disease, can't they? Well, that is an open question. There seems to be some spread from people who only have mild symptoms, and I've seen several reports of that. But there are a few virologists on Twitter, and they they all all appear to be saying the same thing, which is that um, pandemics aren't spread by asymptomatic people. So while you may be able to pass the virus along when you're not symptomatic, the big things that cause people to um, infect other people, like coughing, sneezing, having tons of snot, all that sort of stuff, don't happen when you're when you're asymptomatic. Mm, that's actually definition. true. Yeah, it's a very good point. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> unless you're just licking doorknobs anyway, there's no real way for the virus to spread. <laughs> yeah, look, I mean, I have had to curtail my doorknob nick- licking since the <laughs> virus outbreak started because people have started looking at me strangely. Yeah, well, they would, but they've only now just started to look at you strangely. That's the weird thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a weird country. What? Why do you? Th- why do you think the um, face mask wearing trend hasn't caught on in Australia? And uh, you know, is it we we're just a little bit less you know concerned here, or you know, it seems to be really big, particularly in in um, Asian cultures. Obviously, they, there's a lot of face mask wearing, which I believe uh, is is often more about a desire to not spread an infection if you have it, therefore wearing a face mask rather than infecting other people. But some of the um, some of the photos I've seen online and so forth of the extreme measures people have gone to to cover their faces to you know in their in their um, intention obviously to to not get the virus are um, uh, they're quite amusing. The, the people with bottles on their heads and stuff like this, but but it doesn't seem we're seeing this here. Instead, we've got, of course, the toilet paper craze of everyone buying all of the toilet paper available for some reason that I still can't fathom. I'm assuming they're wrapping it around their face to make a giant mask. Well, <laughs> I don't know. I just I, I don't get it. But, yeah, have you got any thoughts on why um, the, the face masks haven't caught on in Australia? Well, I mean, if I was an optimistic kind of person, I would say it's because everyone's reading the advice from the Department of Health and the CDC (laughs) and that uh, they know that face masks are unlikely to prevent viral spread in the community. Um, 
But I think it might just be more about our culture and that it's not something that most people would think of doing mm. regularly. Yeah, yeah. But it, it is yeah. worth saying, I think, that um, the advice from the Department of Health and from the World Health Organization and the CDC to not wear face masks um, if you are in the community is is actually based on some sound evidence. There was a, a, a couple of randomized control trials where they taught a, a gr groups of people how to use masks. Then they gave uh, half of them masks, half of the people no masks, and they um, recorded how many people got influenza in each group. And there was basically no difference mm. in, the se in a seasonal influenza. There's also the, the problem with masks is that so many people don't wear them properly. You know, they don't cover their nose or they wear it the wrong way around or whatever like that. It's just people don't fully know what to do with a simple mask. Well, yeah, I mean, the hypothesis from this randomized control trial or from these, I think there are two of them, was that the main reason that the masks were ineffective, even after people had had education or, or and knew what they were for, was that people still didn't actually use them properly. Because the if you read up on how to use, well, I mean, so firstly, anyone who's buying surgical masks is just doing something completely uh, ineffective. Uh, my wife's a surgeon and they, they wear the masks to stop the surgeons from infecting the patient, not the other way around. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, and but then um, if you buy a proper respirator, the N95 mask, um, it has to fit perfectly. So it has to form a seal on your face so that the air you breathe goes through the mask's respirator and not through the from the outside. Most people who buy no those beards, masks, no moustaches, they're out. The CDC had that guide that went viral. I don't know if you've seen it. I don't think so. I've only seen, seen the washing hands one. Oh, okay. Well, they've got this brilliant, the CDC has got a brilliant guide on what beards work and don't work for uh, <laughs> respirators. <laughs> I'm going to look that up. <laughs> and it's very funny. Uh, but that, I mean, that's the point. Yeah. Like I've currently got a bit of stubble that probably wouldn't work with a respirator. Oh, wow. No stubble at all. Okay. And I mean, I, I saw someone, I, w I was recently in an airport and I saw someone wearing a respirator um, who then lifted it up, picked his nose, <laughs> put the respirator back on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, charming. Oh, <laughs> and that's precisely the point. Like, you can't reuse them often. Depends on the mask, I think. But mostly you can't reuse them. You can't touch your face while they're on. You can't move them around. You have to just wear the mask, wear it properly, and then take it off and throw it away. And that's not something that most people do. So I, I'm now looking at this CDC uh, uh, advice on which beards can be. And, and the thing I love most about this is I didn't know the names of all these different styles of beards. <laughs> this is fascinating. <laughs> um, but, but it does seem to be pretty bad news for the majority of, of different types of beards. Um, I did see a, 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 something that went viral the other day about um, one of, uh, I think it was uh, an Australian government um, uh, representative was talking about um, the best thing you can do is wash your hands and don't touch your face. And then she stuck her finger in her mouth to lick her her finger to turn the page. Yeah. <laughs> so I will say that the timing was perfect. The thing about this whole um, outbreak is that I'm so much more conscious now of how often I touch my face. It is amazingly how often we do it just to, for a scratch or to brush something out of our eyes or whatever. We do it all the time. Yeah. I've become much more um, aware of how often I touch other people's faces. No, I'm not. I'm joking. <laughs> You're still unaware no, I, of that? I, I, <laughs> I think, still I think completely unaware of that. Someone did recommend touching other people's faces instead of touching your own as a cure. I, d I don't think it I think it was yeah. a bit tongue-in-cheek. We are, we are not uh, condoning that. <laughs> <laughs> Only touch other people's faces if you've got an appropriate consent first. <laughs> But we were talking before about symptoms and being asymptomatic and still spreading it, which is unlikely. But what actually are the symptoms? What do we need to be looking for to know if we've got it? So there's quite a range of symptoms that have been reported. The primary ones that people are looking out for, particularly the World Health Organization, is fever and at least one sign or symptom of respiratory disease. So I've just I've pulled up the WHO case definitions here. The Biggest suspicion is for people, that, or the most common symptoms are people who have a fever and then like a cough, uh, blocked nose, sore throat, that sort of thing, or shortness of breath. Mm -hmm. 
after that, basically anything, any acute respiratory infection, which is basically anything that you would expect if you get a cold or the flu, are the biggest suspected things, the, the, the biggest signs and symptoms that people are looking out for, or the World Health Organization at least. Right. And so if I notice that I've got a fever and uh, you know shortness of breath or something, what's the, the procedure then? Do I go straight to emergency? Do I just quarantine myself at home and hope it gets better? Is, is there a standard procedure for Australians in particular, I guess, on how to act? Yeah. So I was going to say it, it kind of varies a bit from state to state. Mm-hmm. In New South Wales, there's a hotline that you can call to get some advice on what to do. The Department of Health's advice at the moment is to call your GP in advance and then go get tested, essentially. Okay. So, GPs will have some sort of procedure for allowing people in through the waiting rooms without licking other people um, or sneezing on them, more to the point. (laughs) (laughs) Um, We've got to move past this whole licking thing. It's not really (laughs) helpful, I think. Don't sneeze on people. I, th- I think that part of the issue, in, well, one of the things, the idiosyncrasies of the Australian system is that G- general practitioners are uh, independent and they manage their own practices. So I suspect it will depend a bit on your GP. Generally speaking, the advice is not to go straight to emergency, I should say. Um, the coronavirus, much like any disease, you, you'll only be hospitalized if you have symptoms that require hospitalization. So if you turn up the ED, uh, best case scenario, they'll give you a mask, tell you to wait in another room, and then you'll wait until they see you, which might be four or five hours. You know, um, same as if you turn up with, to the ED with a cold. Um, if you're not feeling that sick, if you're feeling very sick, call an ambulance or, or whatever. Uh, but if you generally, I think generally speaking, from what I've heard, and this is from GPs that I've talked to. That's essentially it. You'll turn, turn, call them in advance. They'll give you a mask when you arrive, get you to sit aside from the other patients and run the test pretty much as usual. Yeah, I think we need to be clear that uh, the people who are particularly at risk are the elderly and people with pre-existing chronic conditions uh, like diabetes or heart conditions, I think. Is that right? And uh, they're the people who should be maybe more worried and should call their doctor if they get symptoms. Would you agree with that? Yeah, well, so that seems to be the case. The the fatality rate in people who have comorbid disease, particularly uh, chronic conditions like diabetes or heart disease, is much higher, which, I mean, is in line with most infectious diseases. Uh, it's not really surprising that people who have diabetes uh, get sicker than people who don't have diabetes. What's the best case scenario is that if everyone, if we all, you know, self-quarantine and blah, 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 is it just kind of dies out or is it inevitably going to get out and spread and we're just delaying that as much as possible to get a vaccine and better treatments and so on? Or is that a ridiculous question? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I actually think that's a really interesting question, which is a very hard one to answer. My initial thinking would be that it's basically impossible to prevent the spread right? Because mm. it's it's infectious. It's got You've got a lot of people with mild symptoms who probably who may be able to infect people either before they know they're sick or, or when they've only recently discovered and just started feeling unwell and before they get tested, so they haven't quarantined. But then if you look at what's happened in China, where they've gone from doubling the number of cases every four to five days to having almost a stable number of cases now for Ah, it's about a week, a week and a half of having almost a yeah, that's complete, amazing. Yeah, straight line. It it demonstrates that it definitely is possible to contain the spread of the, the disease. Mm. Whether we'll be successful or not is another question entirely. Yeah. Mm. I, I've also asked, a, I've spoken to a couple of public health ex- experts about this, and what they say is that what's very likely to happen is that even though China has stopped the spread of the disease now. At some point, there will be another outbreak in another place in China, yeah. and then we'll see this happen again. So, basically, our only hope is a vaccine or something at some point. Is that right? It's probably not going to just work itself out and die off naturally? I mean, that that's what most people are saying, yeah. That, that's certainly what the CDC is saying, and that seems to be likely. Although, and I mean, that's happened before, so the influenza uh, pandemic the H1N1 pandemic 
it is now just a circulating infection. So now you people just get it every year. It infected a lot of people in the world and then it kind of died down over winter and then, sorry, over summer. And then when winter came back, a lot of people got infected and now it's just one of the flu infections that we get sometimes. Right. So uh, w- with regard to vaccinations from from what I've read, we're, we're probably at least a year out. Um, uh, what about treatments? Are they is, Have they formalised what the the standard treatments will be for patients presenting with more severe symptoms? Is it all just about treating the symptoms or is there sort of something more um, aggressive? So I've seen quite a few different papers being published, mostly, you know, case series about what people have tried. So I think at the moment there's no one method. People are trying lots of different things to see what works. Um, I know there are a few trials, drug trials already underway in the States, mostly for existing medications that are being used in different ways to try and um, combat the disease. And I right, sus- I heard uh, thimeldehyde was one of, the, one of the ones that's showing some promise. I haven't the infamous a- thimeldehyde. I haven't actually heard that, but... Did you say formaldehyde? Yeah, the, the one that sort of... Do you uh, mean thalidomide? Notorious- Thimil- sorry, thimil- yes, that one, I can't even say it. Yes. <laughs> thalidomide. <laughs> yeah. The one that caused the birth defects, yeah. <laughs> thalidomide makes more sense, actually. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, th- thalidomide is, is used already as a, um, a chemotherapy agent, chemotherapeutic agent. So that makes a bit okay. more sense than uh, formaldehyde, I think. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Unless we're embalming patients. Oh, yes, God. embalming them. Yeah, and they've found that uh, when they embalm them, there's no sign of the disease spreading in that patient. Great, <laughs> right, they're that's, dead. That's true. Um, yeah. So I guess what's what's the upshot then? What should we all be doing? I guess individually, uh, nationally, and globally. Should we not be travelling? Should we be avoiding enclosed spaces or large groups of people? Well, it's interesting. Everyone I know is asking me if I should tra- if they should travel, and I don't have a good answer to that question. How about the question, would you travel? <laughs> Here's a ticket. Here's a ticket. Are you are you going to take it? Are you going to are you going to travel? I think personally I probably wouldn't, but it's more to do with it's not so much about getting the disease per se, but I would rather at this point in time, like right now, a lot of countries are enacting quarantines and I don't want to be stuck in a country that's enacted a quarantine yes. and not being able to get home. So that's for me, that would be a big thing. But people, uh, especially in a, a month or two's time when quarantine measures are likely to be relaxed, I think that the question changes a lot because once if the predictions come true and if the number of cases skyrockets, most countries are probably going to get rid of the quarantines that they've enacted. I mean, there's no point in quarantining people, in preventing all travel from China to Australia if more people in the US have the disease than in China. Yeah, hmm. yeah. yeah. And it's very much a case of closing the, the door after the horse has bolted. Exactly. And, I mean, the travel bans were never recommended by the World Health Organization anyway. Um complete bans there's some evidence that they don't really prevent the spread of disease whereas targeted screening and stuff like that may be more effective although i think what's one of the things that's going to come out of this pandemic or this epidemic of coronavirus is a huge amount of interesting research to see what what has and hasn't worked or what didn't didn't work um but yeah so in march i probably wouldn't personally and also it's worth noting that a lot of travel insurance won't cover you if you get infected yeah yeah or if you go to a place that gets quarantined as well things like that yeah yeah exactly or you know if you if you go to england you'll get free medical care but you might have to but if if you're in a town that gets quarantined you'll still have to pay for your hotel for two or three weeks and potentially that's going to be quite expensive but in April or May, when a, lo- a lot of either a lot more people are going to be sick or the virus will be much better contained, that might change quite a lot. That's interesting because that's when school holidays will be for Victoria. And if there's one thing that is interesting, because I'm a teacher, I work at a school, and I, children are disgusting. Like, <laughs> they are sneezing in your face wiping it with their hand, touching everyone's face and everything else. And, I mean, you know, you try and tell them to wash their hands and this and that, and so we're Mm. trying to reinforce those behaviours. But, you know, kids are gross. 
um, they might they may travel, and there's also real incentives for working parents to send their kids to school. Like it's hard to mm-hmm. self quarantine at home for two weeks, especially mm. with younger children. Mm. Like it's, I just find it all really interesting to think about, you know, how to deal with it without panic. Well, that's the thing. That's the thing that really, you know, amazes me about this is if you, if you look at the figures and yes, you know, exactly as Gideon said, we, we don't know much yet. We can only, there's not enough people that have been infected and enough time elapsed for us to really know how this will play out and what to expect. But, but the numbers, are, the numbers don't seem to, to indicate that there's, there's enough reason to be stock market crashes, you know, desperately going out and buying all the toilet paper you can find, it, which still I just don't understand. Um, there's there's business, businesses already starting to enact travel bans. Uh, we've just been asked by our employer whether we have any plans to travel in the next year. Um, and if so, we have to inform managers. Like there's a whole lot of stuff going on and, and I, I just – it. It really seems everywhere that you look that that's providing advice that's not you know just just people speculating seems to be just business as usual. Do the things you should be doing anyway with regard to hygiene. Mm. Um, it's it spreads the more or less the same way as the the other things we know. Um, the mortality rate, which even if it is three percent, um, you know it's uh, if the if the thing doesn't spread like the measles. We're not talking about wiping out a massive portion of the population. Yes, deaths, there will be some, and it's horrible, but there are with the flu as well. It just seems so bizarre that there's so, so much concern about this. And I was in our office the other day at work, and there were so many people talking about this the whole day. <laughs> and it's like, why? What, what is it about this that's captured the imagination and the, the attention of the population so much? Um, when well over half of them don't care about climate change, it's just weird. It's, it's just well. I, I mean, I, th- I like I said, I think that the fear is rational to some extent. I mean, firstly because there are a lot of unknowns, and a lot of unknowns means a lot of things to worry about. And I, I also I think that um, I mean, panic buying toilet paper is obviously an extreme example of weird behavior brought about by stress. But I think that yeah. disease like this is particularly worrying for a lot of people because it means isolation. It means um, the potential. It really has the potential to affect everybody. Um, and if it does become, if there is sustained large amounts of community spread in Australia, and you see, you know, five percent of the population getting sick, even if the fatality rate is only zero point five percent, that's still a lot of people. Once you once you've gotten uh, over a million people infected, zero point five percent becomes fifty thousand, or you know twenty five thousand. That's sort of those sort of numbers of people who've died and many more people who've whose lives have been permanently impacted by the disease. So, I think panic is unhelpful, but but fear does make sense. It's not it's not completely out of the uh, realm of it's not like fantastical imaginations of people that this may significantly impact their lives. But you probably don't need 50 rolls of toilet paper right now. <laughs> yeah. you, the, the chances that you will ever need to stockpile to- toilet paper in Australia, a country that makes its own toilet paper, is relatively <laughs> small. <laughs> <laughs> the chance yeah. that you may need to spend two weeks at home and so have to get friends and family to drop off um, some you know, chocolate to make you feel better, that, that's not as small. And the chance that you know someone who's immunocompromised or could get, or pregnant, or elderly with multiple comorbidities is, I mean, it's almost a given, I would say, that you know at least one person whose life could mm. be significantly impacted by the virus. Yeah. Uh, is there a test for it, though? Like, if I do go to the doctor or the hospital or something, can they just do a blood test and go, yep, you've got COVID-19 or, or the coronavirus? From what I've heard, there are currently three tests being used, the main one of which is PCR testing, which is polymerase chain reaction. And then I think there are also some other tests that are used as confirmatory testing because they take a bit longer. Okay. You mentioned in your um, Guardian article, Gideon, about the spurious claims that are being made by 
people saying, oh, we've got the, uh, you know, we've got the cure. They always come out of the woodwork, the snake oil salesman and so forth. So there's no, you know, I think you said something like there's, you know, no shortage of people selling, you know, supplements and such to uh, to cure the disease. But of course, there there isn't a cure. We don't we don't have one yet. Yeah, absolutely. As far as I know, the even the treatments are mostly to kind of yeah treat the symptoms as we said earlier um and antivirals are being trialed but we don't we're not sure about that but abs- there's definitely no shortage of people who are claiming different methods to try and um either prevent or treat coronavirus and the one that i've been tweeting about um which is my by far my favorite is that um there's some correlation between uh having a lot of sex or orgasms generally and uh a better immune system so some people are saying that to prevent coronavirus you should masturbate or have sex <laughs> look it's probably not gonna hurt <laughs> you know what have you got to lose you like your well, job depending on where you're doing it but still um <laughs> yeah, look, if, if you are going to try this method my advice is to do it in the privacy of your own home uh, it's unlikely to impact your chances of getting the coronavirus, but at least it will be a lot more fun than eating raw garlic. Yes, or sitting there with your stockpile of toilet bag, you're saying, "I'm safe, I'm safe." Yeah, exactly. I'm it's- sorry. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna say it right here and now. Quarantining yourself at home, masturbating, is a great way to stop the spread of the virus. <laughs> I think that is just science right there. <laughs> I, I I'm think- just rolling my eyes. You can't see it. <laughs> 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 it, it is worth noting, I think, that the Lancet article uh, said that a lot of preventing the spread of coronavirus may be a lot down to individuals, and particularly people who are sick, people who are feeling sick. Hmm. It may be very important to prevent the virus to spread for people who are feeling sick to stay home, to contact their doctor before they go, to wear a mask if they can access one, which... It, it's a bit infuriating that there are no masks anywhere now because if people do get sick, they can't access masks. But that's another story. So the upshot is everyone should be washing their hands far more than they are and for longer than they are, at least 20 seconds. Is that the basic take-home message that we need? Don't lick things, stay home, masturbate, and wash your hands all the time. Are we happy with that advice? <laughs> I, I'm not, not the sure takeaways. if I can endorse that. <laughs> It does sound like a nice takeaway message. Well, I think I think something practical that people can take away as well is uh, preparation is not a bad idea. So setting up um, the potential to work from home if you need to, um, having some way of like talking to your friends and relatives and saying, oh, well, if I have to stay at home, can you bring me a box of lentils or something? It's not a bad idea. Yeah. And don't over panic, though. If you're going to be quarantined, it's going to be two to three weeks max. So yeah. you don't need 500 rolls of toilet paper for that unless you've got another problem, which is a different story. And we live in Australia. You can access food delivery services. You can, uh, even if you are living by yourself, you can, there's probably some way for you to get um, essential supplies. It's likely to be a relatively short period of time. And if you get really sick, you'll probably have to be hospitalized anyway, so you won't be staying at home. Um, yeah. And... My advice from The Guardian is not to panic because panic is uh, a bad idea generally. Um, and I think it's also worth noting that pandemic is uh, not to do with the severity of a disease. It's to do with how far it's spread. Mm-hmm. So everyone who gets scared about the word pandemic uh, doesn't necessarily need to because pandemic is more about how many people in how many regions of the world have a disease and not about um, how deadly that specific disease is. That's a really, really good point. I've played pandemic it is impossible to win. A number of times I've played. The <laughs> there are game, so many you, ways to lose that win. game. It is so impossible. Many times we've played that game. We've gone and we've we've realised someone that we actually lost like six turns ago. Oh yeah, god! Because we forgot a rule or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I've, I've actually. Have you ever played um, Pandemic Legacy? No, no, no. I w- would strongly recommend uh, checking it out. It's a very fun game. I'll add it to the list Excellent. right now. All right. Well, I think that's actually a really good place to leave that discussion. I think we covered all the important points. Uh, really grateful Fantastic. for your time and joining us here, Gideon. That was terrific. No, that was a pleasure. It was a lot of fun. I mean, as I said, I can't answer all your questions because at best I'm, uh, you know, working in chronic disease most of the time. Uh, but I think it's also worth noting that most people can't answer most of the questions that people have. Um, oh, I would say, very important point, if you do, 
If you're worried about coronavirus, the, the, the Federal Department of Health in um, Australia, uh, health.gov.au, has um, a coronavirus page um, that's worth checking out. You can just Google Department of Health coronavirus. Um, the World Health Organization has a very good explainer and several uh, fact sheets um, as well. Again, just world, just Google World Health Organization coronavirus. And the US CDC similarly has a lot of good information. So those are some places you can go to get the facts. Because I have seen a huge amount of misinformation being spread even among friends and family. You know, everything from breathe in steam um, to get IV vitamin C to prevent coronavirus. None of wow. which is... Yeah. IV vitamin C? <laughs> wow. Okay, that's full. Yeah. Uh, I also want to mention uh, the This Week in Virology podcast and also the ABC has a podcast with Dr. Norman Swan called Coronacast, which is also really, really good. So I recommend listening to them after you're done listening to Science on Top for more information. And heading to twitter.com slash gidmk for <laughs> all the latest updates from an expert in epidemiology. Uh, I, uh, updates, yes, <laughs> but most, mostly um, posting about very silly things. I, I made a joke we'll about... It. We'll take it. <laughs> well, I made a joke about eating the rich that was picked up by the Daily Telegraph, and that was my <laughs> favourite thing that happened this week. I love it. Um, also, I think, uh, do you want to give a plug for your podcast, which is also really, really interesting and fun? Oh, uh, yeah, sure. Um, I do a podcast called Sensationalist Science, which is on... Uh, SoundCloud or most places you get podcasts um, and it's about science and media misconceptions and how the sensationalism in a lot of medical news. There's sensationalism in medical news? <laughs> I know Surely people are always not. surprised. <laughs> so uh, basically that'll cover whether or not mobile phones cause cancer and if we should all cut out sugar completely because it is the worst thing we could ever look at. Absolutely. Uh, I think the yeah. first episode I recorded was actually about snorting sugar to cure influenza. Snorting sugar. Wow. Okay. Yeah, that was actually a, a wonderful misconception that some journalists just ran with, and it was hilarious. It just completely misunderstood what the science was about. Fantastic. Well, we'll have links to all those resources uh, and Twitter feeds and podcasts in the show notes and on the web at scienceontop.com. Because uh, I think we're going to leave it there. It was a lot of interesting discussion. Wash your hands, people, uh, and keep an ear out for the good information from the right sources. So thank you, Gideon. Thank you, Penny. And thank you, Lucas. Thanks, Ed. My pleasure. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Ed. And thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back next week putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then.